America, a ten pack. I'm gonna need you to remain standing while we recite our fearless creed. Repeat after me. We must exist in a state of man glorious as we are protected by the red, the white, and the blue. But remember, the mind is the key. Sissy. Being a member of the Fearless Army means that we pledge to place God first and foremost in our everyday endeavors of life. This means placing him before everything. And yes, men, including your wife. Being a member of the Fearless Army, you know that all men are created equal. And you know this, despite whatever the media may try to teach you. We as fearless men must step up and accept the challenge to step up and then lead. Meaning that you may have to take the flag, even if I start to bleed. This is why it's so important to protect and nurture the life of that unborn seed. See, we here at Fearless, we thank God for our families. We thank God for our land. But the one thing that we are thankful for most of all is Lord, we say thank you for making me a man. Can we all say together, challenge accepted, Fearless Army at ease. <laughs> Welcome to Fearless. <laughs> I'm your thrill sergeant, Uncle Jimmy. That's Big Jason Whitlock, AKA Mary McCheese. It's Wednesday. Of course, that means it's Tennessee Harmony. You know the group, the Gap Band, had a song back in the day called The Boys Are Back in Town. And that's exactly what we have today. We've been joined by Pastor Bobby and Pastor Anthony. That's right, the boys are back in town. So let's get this show started. Let's hit the likes, let's hit the subscribes, let's give him five stars. Go get your fearless gear at shopblazemedia.com slash fearless. Now, I'm here to tell y'all, if this guy prepared the meal for the Last Supper, Jesus would have named him Chef. Boy, you're big. Let's give it up for my guy, Jason Whitlock. Come on, DJ, give me some music. Thank you. Thank you, Uncle Jimmy. Uh, good job, uh, as Jimmy's already welcomed you. Let's get right uh, to my fire today. Uh, and today's show is going to be a little bit different. I'm, I'm not wearing a jacket. Uh, I don't know. I just don't feel like wearing one today. It's Tennessee Harmony Day. And we're going to go a little harmony a little earlier today because my fire starter uh, I think works well for uh, Pastor Anthony and Pastor Bobby. And so let's get right to it. Uh, the outpouring of public emotion in reaction to the tragic and unexpected passing of former Broncos receiver Demarius Thomas has made me ponder our fixation with an attitude toward death. Thomas, 33, died late last week in his Georgia home. Reports indicate he suffered a seizure while showering and died of cardiac arrest. For a four-year stretch, Thomas was quarterback Peyton Manning's favorite target in Denver and one of the NFL's five or six best receivers. In 2016, thanks to the heroics of the Denver defense, Manning and Thomas and the Broncos won a Super Bowl title. Demarius Thomas was a very good football player. But like Vincent Van Gogh, Thomas's premature death elevated his stature in modern American culture. I do not say that to denigrate Thomas or his legacy. Demarius Thomas lived a truly fascinating and inspiring life. His short narrative arc is worthy of a chapter in the Bible. He was born to a 16-year-old mother and a father who left him to join the military. Thomas and his mother shared a trailer in the woods of rural Georgia. His mother and his maternal grandmother were small time crack cocaine dealers. When Thomas was 11 years old, law enforcement busted up his grandmother's drug ring, sentencing grandma to life in prison and mama to 24 years. 
In order to remain loyal to her mother, Thomas's mother turned down a plea deal that would have seen her do just four years. Demaryius Thomas's rise from poverty and dysfunction was a modern miracle worthy of a movie. The impact and importance of his life far exceeded his death. But our modern secular culture celebrates death more than life, or at least that's the way it feels to me in 2021. I wanna be transparent today about all of this. This monologue, this fire starter, is more stream of consciousness than fully formed opinion or belief. I'm inviting you and Pastor Anthony and Pastor Bobby to help me think this through. I've been pondering this topic for more than two years. It started in 2019 when the rapper Nipsey Hussle was murdered. Corporate and social media responded to Hussle's death like it was a second assassination of Tupac Shakur. Shakur was a transcendent rapper with an international audience. He starred in movies. He was a household name. Nipsey Hussle was a local rapper. He was Los Angeles' version of Young Dolph, the local rapper no one outside of Memphis had heard of until he was murdered just this past November. Tomorrow, Memphis is holding a Celebration of Life event at FedEx Forum in honor of Young Dolph. Tickets sold out in less than 90 minutes. Memphis renamed a street to honor Young Dolph. Young Dolph was a cliche, mediocre rapper. He rapped about dealing drugs, bitches, hoes, and the usual. Had he not been killed, no one outside of Memphis would know him. Listen to this clip of his music from, I think a song called 100 Shots. I don't wanna denigrate Young Dolph. I'm trying to understand our fixation and relationship with death. I get and accept death's ability to exonerate and cleanse. Should it exalt? George Floyd's criminal past became irrelevant the moment police handcuffed and subdued him to the point he no longer posed a threat to them, the public, or himself. I'm good with that. Floyd's criminal past, however, does not justify Derek Chauvin kneeling on his neck and back area for nine minutes. Totally get that. But Floyd's death does not justify the exaltation that has been showered on him. The statues, memorials, and reverence are misguided and inappropriate. We've turned George Floyd into an idol. We've done this because our modern secular culture places more importance on death than life. Our modern, internet-driven society attaches our emotions and attention to people we do not know. Many of us have shed as many tears over the distant internet idols like Floyd, Nipsey Hussle, and Young Dolph than family members and friends, the people we actually know, engage, and live with. It's unhealthy, it's unnatural. Our values are upside down. We're chasing the approval of man, not God. This is why corporate media constantly talks about being on the right side of history. History is written by man. It's written by the people in power. What made America great, what pushed this country to address its sins was a pursuit of being on the right side of God. Man's history can be rewritten in an election cycle. It can be manipulated and redefined by a Google algorithm. God's truth is unshakable. I don't have this figured out. I want to start a conversation today. I want you to help me figure it out. What's not right about how we view death, how we respond to death, and why we seem far more fixated on death than life. The threat of death is being used to impose fear and make heroes of unworthy men. All right, that's my fire starter uh, for today. Uh, 
We're going to be joined here shortly by our Tennessee Harmony pastors, Pastor Anthony and Pastor Bobby. But before we get to them, I'm gonna do a little business here and talk to you about my friends and our friends over at Good Ranchers. They have a variety of boxes to give as gifts this season. Choose the Ranchers Classic for the perfect combo of high quality beef and tender chicken, or go with the Cowboy to have the ultimate steakhouse experience with black Angus ribeyes, Wagyu burgers, and more. Most of what you find at the store is imported from who knows where with who knows what in it. But Good Ranchers only sources and sells meats from here in the US of A. And every piece in your order is individually wrapped and vacuum sealed to lock in flavor and freshness for up to a year. Whether you eat it that night or three months from now, it will be the best meal you've had each time. Give a gift, they'll remember Give a gift they'll actually use. Get your Good Ranchers box or gift card today. Tis the season for open hearts and full stomachs. So give Good Ranchers with my code FEARLESS for $20 off and free express shipping. Just go to GoodRanchers.com FEARLESS or use the promo code FEARLESS at checkout to take advantage of this special holiday offer today. Good Ranchers, support our sponsors because they support me, you, and our point of view. All right, Pastor Bobby, Pastor Anthony, next. All right, welcome back. Uh, time for some Tennessee harmony and some insight uh, from Pastor Bobby and Pastor Anthony about my uh, fire starter today. Gentlemen, I'll, before I get your thoughts on that, I would ask you to bless our conversation with a, with a short prayer, and then we'll get rolling. All right, I'll pray. God, uh, I'm just grateful to be on a show where we can pray and where the host wants it to be on air. So we just pray that you'd be honored and glorified by everything we talk about. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Father God, we continue this prayer just giving thanks and glory to you and for all that you've done for us. Uh, we ask that you bless the conversation and that those that are listening will be blessed as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, let's start with a, just a general question. Am I right? Has our relationship uh, reaction to obsession or fixation, has our relationship with death changed in modern American culture? Or maybe it's always been this way and I was just asleep, unaware, or I, I don't know, maybe social media has made me, made it feel different, but it's always been this way. Uh, let, me, let me do this before we get deep off in that. Uh, we just wanted to say we appreciate you, Jason. Uh, for having us on the show uh, and what you've done for us. So I've got a little token uh, I wanted to give you. Oh, are you doing it? Yeah, this is the last time I'm gonna see you guys for a couple of weeks before Christmas. Uh, so you, oh man, is, is that? So I do a little woodwork on the side and there's a cutting board there. Perfect. For you and for your mom, <laughs> and it's hard to decide. So you get to pick which one uh, you gonna want. I'm going to take the bigger one. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be good for your good ranchers. Yes, it will. Sit on. Oh, man, I appreciate that. Uh, we always appreciate you. All right, well, Merry Christmas. I'm sorry I don't have a gift for you. <laughs> you're uh. good. You're good. So, you know, to answer your question about death, um, I do see a shift in how we've talked about life and how we've talked about death in our culture. And I believe it starts with how we become famous. You know, back historically, you became famous because of the impact that you had. I mean, if you go back to even Jesus, he had an impact on the world. He dies, obviously. Uh, you know, historically, you've got great artists, great musicians, they had such an impact because they shifted culture. They introduced uh, a new art form. They transformed things. Their impact was magnanimous. So if they died, when they died, if they died, you know, tragically, suddenly, 
we're left with, wow, someone that had all this insight, knowledge, et cetera, was taken away, that impact we may miss. Now, people become famous because of how many followers they have on social media. Uh, they become famous because of being famous, you know, not necessarily a talent associated with it, not a skill, not a uh, thought process. It's just I'm able to garner, you know, many uh, followers. And then I look at it as well, you know, with the younger generation. I remember when Facebook came out. Uh, I remember when MySpace was was out. But when Facebook came out, you know, when I got in, I think it was maybe 100,000 people on the whole platform. Now you've got kids that are in, you know, high school with Instagram. Well, if I got all of my friends on Instagram, you know, all the people at my school are following me, I mean, that's a thousand people. You know, just imagine that kind. Of, and then as that multiplies and they tell their friends. So by the time I get out of school, I got 10,000 people listening to what I have to say, regardless of if it was well thought out, et cetera. And so that kind of fame happens, even artists, you know, rap artists, et cetera. So now when they die, you know, it's like, wow, this person was so they had so many followers, but we can't answer. Well, what did they do? Like, what was their impact? other than being followed by so many. So as we look at how we deal with death now, now, you know, even as a kid, I can remember this, you know, people die every few seconds. People are born every few seconds. That's, that's period. But if we shift the focus from focusing on impact and life to now focusing on, oh, this person died today, this person died today, this person died today, that can shift how we even appreciate life and how we recognize death. Anthony, you've made a brilliant point. I'm going to uh, add a word to your, what the point you just made. Mm -hmm. It's almost like I wish we had talked beforehand because I would have given you this word because yeah. I loved it. Impact used to be very important and that's how you became famous. Mm -hmm. Attention yes, is what it. everybody is seeking now, right. and that's how you become famous. And it doesn't matter how you garner that attention. Right. If you put out the most profane, perverted music on the planet, mm -hmm. but it garners attention, great. If you put out a sex tape, not to pick on anybody, but mm -hmm. Kim Kardashian mm -hmm. or whatever, and you can garner attention, awesome. And so it, it is like, the, it's almost like the purpose of our life is being manipulated and changed in terms of people like Martin Luther King mm -hmm. had great impact on society. And we used to people, how can I have that kind of impact? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What can I do to now it's what can I do to garner attention? Yes. And then people were so attention starved that okay, uh, someone's died, how can I use this to garner attention for me? Right. How can I exploit, right. manipulate? Oh, this young Dolph, who I'm just saying, most people had never heard of, had no impact, uh, really, but a month after his death, they're throwing a celeb, a month later, they're still gaining attention, selling tickets, profiting off mm -hmm. the attention that can be made. Oh, Young black rapper killed early. We can get attention off that. Mm -hmm. That that's a really profound point about w what people are actually doing, dedicating their lives to. Are they trying to have a positive impact, or are they just trying to garner attention and how it can benefit themselves? And, and you mix that with the media's obsession with the next new thing. So now we have to find the next one because news now, 24 hours, it gets old and stale real quick. So once this is over, what's the next one that we're gonna, oh, well, this one died. Well, he must have been like, wait a minute. Now all we're talking about is death. What, what about life? What did they do in their life? What impact did they leave? Now we've shifted to, so I see it, I see it. You uh, began the 
monologue by talking about people say we want to be on the right side of history. Uh, I really think we, the, according to the Bible, we want to be on the right side of eternity. Mm. And so everything from a biblical point of view is that the life that's really life is that which comes after death in terms of the good things you did in this world that, that you literally send them ahead of you. And of course, God was there. God remembers everything. God will reward us in eternity for what happens in this life. If you contrast that with what we're talking about, uh, which I think you guys are doing a great job on, it's like this life is all we have. Everything in this life is everything, and fame in this life is the best thing. And so whatever little fame somebody had, let's make them even more famous in death. And somehow that gives this pseudo false sense of a significant life. The Bible creates an entirely different point of view. It says that this life is preparation for that which is really life, which is in eternity, and the life we we're best off living for is to do the best we can for as many people in this world so that when we come before God and in eternity, God is the one who praises and rewards us. Bobby, you just took me somewhere I wasn't planning to go, uh, but I just had a conversation last night that kind of plays off the, the point you were making, and it's related to Kyle Rittenhouse. And, and last night I was out to dinner with some friends, and the conversation turned to Kyle Rittenhouse, and we were debating how he was handling his first few weeks, months after being found not guilty. and. I expressed, and some of the others expressed, like, disappoint. He seems to be chasing fame. He's doing a lot of interviews. And, and it's, I, I woke up this morning, and I saw something where he's speaking at some political-type rally, and, and someone tweeted out the thought I had is like, what does he have to say at a, at, a, at a political rally? Well, I mean, he's 18. The stuff I've seen from him seems like a nice enough kid, but doesn't seem like he's ready to have anything that profound to say. Mm -hmm. But I just, I see a young person that's being handled by, like, because we were talking this last night, what advice is he being given? Someone that cares about him would be like, Let's lay low. Let's get out of the spotlight. Let's let this and let's start transitioning you back into the normal 18 year old's life. And instead, they seem to be transitioning. How can we make you a personality and more famous? And, and I, it connects to this overall. We have such an obsession with fame. Yeah. Yes. And, and, it everybody not only worship idols, but everybody wants to be an idol. Yes, and that's it. Makes me make why the TV show American Idol mm. is so popular, and there have been so many shows that basically have mimicked that. That came out, and then there, now there's got to be a dozen shows about who can be a singer, who can do. Everybody has turned themselves into a reality show. So, so one link that I see between both of those, um, you talked about him, you know, being famous or going after fame. I've always been concerned about how social media gives voice to things that might not need that kind of air, that kind of light. And so you imagine being, you know, 15, <coughs> 16 years old, you're still formulating your thought process. You don't even know, you don't even understand but to have thousands of people echoing your thought, it now gives it validation. Well, it must be. All these people liked what I said. Everybody liked what I said. So on this side, you have a culture that is selfie centered, that is fame chasing. But then on the other side, you have this piece that is, you know, death is we're talking about it so much. In my ministry, 
one of the most difficult things that I face is death. You know, my church members, their family. It's a sad time. It's, it's difficult. And sometimes, you know, Bobby and I talk about this. Sometimes I have to kind of check myself because, you know, last year I had a stretch of, you know, within two months, I was at 11 funerals. Now, that much death for me psychologically, you know, that could really weigh on you. And so sometimes I have to say, hey, guys, I need you to pray for me because, man, I'm seeing, you know, crying families. I'm seeing people that I was close to. Man, I just talked to them yesterday. Wow, this is tough. But now mix that with this fame culture and magnify it to the masses. So now everybody is seeing Every day this person died, this person died. I'm concerned because I know that gets to me where I have to I have to pull back. I can't see this much death and have a positive outlook on life. And so I get concerned. So when you put those two things together, what you saw, I see that, man, we're magnifying. We're social media. We're pushing, pushing, pushing. And then we've got this. We're talking about death every day. We got to We got to check up on that, man. I, another excellent point that takes me to uh, just expounding on Anthony's point, we've, we've got a culture now that goes from murder trial to murder trial to murder trial to murder trial. And as soon as one murder trial wraps up, we all, well, what's the next big murder trial that we can all be racially divided on or all can sit up and have this really strong opinion about whoever the alleged perpetrator is or whoever the victim is. And, and it's like, I, 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 from forensic files to all the TV shows dedicated to every TV show, it seems like is, it's a life or death situation. It's all centered around death and who's killing who. And, and I'm not sure if it's reflective of reality in terms of if there are 330 million people living in America and we have about 10,000 murders a year and we have about 20 controversial murders a year but all of our attention <coughs> is focused on that it does seem like it would uh, disrupt destroy diminish the psych the mental health yeah, it gives a totally our... false perspective on what life's all about and where things really are at so much of, I think, what we're dealing with in our world is it's a clickbait world. And what's happening is with social media, especially social media, but also the news, the 24-hour news, it's like, how are we going to get attention? And the way we get attention is by famous people. Even if they're not so famous, we make them more famous because um, all we have is this life. And especially if somebody dies, it's the ultimate tragedy on this side of history because it's all they had. And so somebody's a little bit famous. We, with clickbait and conversations, we make it a big deal. And in the midst of doing all of that, the thing that really is the big deal, which is the kind of lives that we live, the love that we share, the life we give to other people, and our awareness that one day we're gonna stand before Jesus and answer for our lives and then be rewarded, that is not the narrative that uh, is consistent with clickbait. Mm. I, I, I've heard, you know, been to enough funerals to hear <clears throat> ministers give the little speech about the dash in between 1967 and you died in 2007. And what did you do with that little dash or whatever? And, and th that why, the reason I brought up the Demarius Thomas deal because this guy lived fascinating and inspiring. He overcame a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that needs to be examined, needs to be used as an example to people. Here's how to overcome obstacles in your life. Here's how to transcend maybe modest beginnings yeah. and things like that. But <clears throat> he's never really famous, not, you know, or his fame go in death because he died, and I get it, he died young or whatever, but there doesn't seem to be an intense focus on how people are choosing to live and, and the results that that produces. That's right. <clears throat> uh, I love, Pey I don't know if you heard Peyton Manning's line about him. He said, 
He was a better human being than he was a football player. And he was a Hall of Fame football player. Mm, not quite, That's a story I want to hear. Pro Bowl football yeah, player, but not, not sure about Hall of Fame. But anyway. I'm no, no, no. So when you say that about the dash, it reminds me of uh, the scripture that we have, James 4 and 14, the latter part of that verse. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears a little time, then vanishes away. Um, James expresses our life is a vapor. It is just momentary. It's quicker than we think. We often think about that as it relates to people that die young. But, you know, even my family that I've had all my life, if I were to lose them, say, man, they were 60 some years old. Even that time feels like it was just too soon. But what that verse is talking about is not just death. It's talking about life. Like how much if we spend our life making this shift, the shift from success to significance, that would change how we approach our everyday situation. If I go through life thinking about how can I be successful, how much money I can make, I'm going to cut throat, I'm going to do whatever just to climb the corporate ladder, just to be famous, how can I get out there? But if I shift that to significance, how am I adding value? How are my relationships? If they were to go today, you know, what impact would that have on me? Have I done today? Have I lived today in a way that I'm OK with how everything else stands? Or did I leave something? You know what? I need to call. As we talk about Demarius Thomas, uh, Shannon Sharp had mentioned on air that somebody had reached out to him because he and Demarius were close and they had a close mutual friend. And so this mutual friend reached out to Shannon Sharp to say, hey, man, you need to holler at Demarius. You know, you just need to reach out to him. And he says, yeah, OK, I'll get to it. Yeah. You know, I've been meaning to talk to him. And then he dies. So in two months time from what Shannon says, he had two months to reach out to him and he never did. And now he'll never get that opportunity. So if I think about my life and I think about, man, everybody that I encounter, a lot of what goes through my mind, too, is, you know, did I share Jesus today? Did the people that I impacted today, did we talk about Jesus? Because that at the end of the day, for me, is what I want to be in that dash. Not so much my accomplishments, not so much my successes. You know, I was born into the world with nothing. I'm going to leave with nothing. So none of that's going on the dash. But what impact did I have when I you know, speak at funerals or sing at funerals and things like that? I tell the audience, we're not here because they died. We're here because they lived. And all of us in this room are here because of the impact they had on our life. But then I also challenge them because we don't know where death may lie for us. But we do know and have control over what I do today. How am I impacting today? How do we leave? You know, Bobby and I, when we see each other, oftentimes we're meeting with a prayer. We're leaving with a prayer. And if I were to go or Bobby is to go, what could be said about it? Last thing I said to Bobby, we prayed to God. But that's going to be that leaves me at the end of the day with, wow, this was an impact. I want to. Talk about something I, I, I mentioned in the column and I want you all's thoughts on. I, I think about my childhood and just being a young person and, and how I, I feel like my youth was far less burdened than the, a lot of the weight these young people carry today because I, I would hear about celebrities passing and I would, ah, that's interesting. Well, <laughs> now I see young people because of social media People that they've never met, never really engaged with, unlikely to ever meet them or engage with them, they have all of this emotion tied into them. The emotion that I had tied into my grandmother and aunts and uncles or whatever, they have these, they probably got those relationships, but they have these extra relationships with all these idols and entertainers and people that they follow. And heck, not even, uh, George Floyd is not in, an entertainer or anything, but people are so emotional about mm -hmm. people that they're not that connected to. And, and maybe we should be. Maybe that's our hearts should be opened and very. 
But man, that just seems like a heck of a burden to be carrying around. And it, it, it's, it's one, of, I just think the shame of this internet world that we have, that sometimes we have more emotion towards people we've connected with from following on social media than the people that are actually in our lives on a day-to-day -day basis. Is it, I'm trying to understand this as well, so I'm, I'm wondering, you know, sometimes uh, you deny something is there and so you suppress it, but it's still gonna come back out. So I think that we live in a culture that is in denial about eternity and like what happens after death and how significant that is. Uh, and if you do that, like in churches today, uh, there's tremendous pressure on preachers not to talk about, say, hell and judgment and things like that. And so a lot of preachers have gone quiet on that. Mm -hmm. And when they go quiet on that, uh, they just preach this thing like everybody's going to go to heaven. And so it creates this uh, almost uh, mythical uh, positivity about death. And then at the same time, it's actually not talked about very much at all. And so there's a suppression. And is it possible that it's coming out in the way that you're saying it? That it's nobody's talking about it, so we're going to make a big deal when this happens. Mm. I don't know if, I, if I'm answering your question, Bob, but one of the things I've, I've said and believe is that as the society has become more secular, and, and has less faith in eternity, they become more fearful of dying because dying is a period, an exclamation point, yeah. uh, and- And then, are, then it's it, everything's yeah, over. Yeah, everything's over, and for believers, it's like, no, this is just the beginning of yeah. a run-on sentence that's yeah. gonna go on. Yeah. <laughs> it's gonna go yeah. on. And it really, you know, uh, uh, Jesus teaches us to really uh, make plans for eternity, to store up treasures in heaven, to make sacrifices here now, knowing that God will reward you later. Uh, somebody said that the people who do the most good in this world are those who are most focused on the next because they're not preoccupied with themselves, they're preoccupied with the things of God. And I think if you check it out historically in terms of hospitals and schools and uh, relief projects and all of that. The people who are most sacrificial in this world have been those focused on what God thinks in eternity. You know, as it relates to, you know, the culture, you're talking about the secularism, a lot of people because of a disconnect from God, a disconnect from Jesus, are, are living vicariously through these celebrities or they are gaining some kind of validation themselves from their attachment to these celebrities like oh such and such followed me back wow that makes me something you know or i like such and such you talk about how the generation now they're carrying all this because i'm trying to be validated i'm trying to gain you talk about your upbringing my upbringing celebrity life was just like a separate chapter it was a it was it was not really reality for us. Reality for me was what you're talking about. The people around our table, the people in our neighborhood, that celebrity, I, he doesn't know me. I don't know him. Even if I go to the game, they don't know who I am. You know, I'm there to celebrate, but they don't know me. But the people around the table, the people I go to church with, those are the real connections that I have. And so even my identity, I felt more of a connection with making, you know, good grades and doing what I'm supposed to do at home and then maybe going to Wednesday night Bible class and, hey, I got a such and such on my report. You did a good job. You know, those people proud than a celebrity follow that doesn't know me from Adam and won't have that kind of connection. So that if they died, it's not that I don't value their life, but it is. What does that perspective mean on my life and the impact that I'm making now? Where are we going with this now? And I love what, how Bobby's making this connection as well, which is if we have a heavenly perspective, we die once. But we live every day. Like we're, we're 
every day I've got to live. You know, there's going to be a day that I'm going, but I got to do this thing. I got to make choices today. I got to make relationships today. I need to share Jesus today with what I have today. Yeah, I'll die, but there is an afterlife. That whole YOLO stuff, you only live once. I like what you're saying. If we compact everything that we do into this one life, then yes, we better live it up. If yeah. This is it. <laughs> <laughs> we better really be afraid of dying because right. it's all over once that happens. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to take a little quick break. When we come back, I'm going to ask you guys about technology. I think it's did, the Unabomber wrote a manifesto uh, about technology and saying that technology was basically going to ruin the world. And I'm, I'm starting <laughs> like I agree with him. Uh, that that we've got th this technology has created an arrogance within man, and it, it's it's oh my God I can cut your penis off and make you a woman I can give you this app uh, Facebook where you can create a life that you wish you were living and you can portray to everybody else. Mm -hmm. it, Technology, I think, is our undoing. I'm gonna give you guys a chance to marinate on that. Uh, but first, I wanna tell you about my friends at Sweatblock. There's nothing worse than walking into a situation where you're going to have to be around or in front of a bunch of people, and all of a sudden, you start to sweat. I've been there, and my guess, you have too. This is why I use Sweatblock antiperspirant wipes. Now, I know this is going to sound crazy, but I literally only have to use sweat block once or twice a week and it keeps me dry the entire time. It's stronger and more effective than most clinical antiperspirants. And here's the beauty of it. It's so simple. Use it in the morning before you start your day and you are good to go. No need to worry about sweat all day, guaranteed. Sweat block is a complete game changer and you need to get it now. If you're someone, you, if you or someone you love is dealing with this, you have to check out sweatblock.com. Get it today for 20% off at sweatblock.com with the promo code FEARLESS. That's sweatblock.com with the promo code FEARLESS. All right, more with Pastor Bobby and Anthony. X. All right, welcome back. I'm going to pick up where I left off and, and just say to you guys, summarize my thoughts about technology. I think it's helped create, enhance a God complex in man. We're so mesmerized by what we feel like we can do and, and think, oh, <laughs> we feel like this is brand new. People don't have any mm. idea they were building pyramids thousands of years ago that more techno, more advanced than the stuff we have today. And so I, I just feel like Man is so impressed with himself right now that he believes, we believe, we're in charge. We decide uh, the meaning of your life. We decide whether you lived a good life or not. We're we'll decide if you're on the right side of history and blah, blah. It's all, it's all, everything's under our control. And, and de we've decided <clears throat> death is the exclamation point, the period of your life. And, you know, either we don't believe in God or we think we're smarter than God. And that's what's at the heart of our, of virtually every problem we have. So I have a question for you. Uh, is your concern with technology itself or with who controls technology? I don't know. And I'm actually looking for guidance on that because I'm pro I've am i said this to you guys mm -hmm. two, three, four months ago. I was like, do the Amish have it right? Yeah. <laughs> Should I be on a horse and buggy somewhere with that? And I continue to go that direction like, you know what, this technology, the phones, the whole deal. People, people used to write love letters to each other yeah. and would wait two weeks on someone's letter to get here to find. And was that I, their love more passionate than this easy access we have to commu communication? And, and it's like you don't even have to ante up much to get someone to feel like they're in love with you where you used to have to put in time, real effort, sacrifice, discipline, and things were more meaningful there. So you're saying we just had to put a couple of 
hearts on your post and that let you know. <laughs> there it is. Whereas back in the day, you had to have a song, a playlist, uh, letters and flower and come across town. Okay. Take them to dinner. Yeah, yeah, be yeah. nice to their mama and daddy. Right, treat right. their little brother or sister well. There was a whole <laughs> bunch of things you had to do. Now, swipe right or swipe left, good to go. So I'm, I'm conflicted about this conversation. Uh, here's, here's the nature of where I'm conflicted. First of all, <clears throat> technology, I've always believed, uh, can be either good or bad, depending on who uses it. Sure. So like Christians have had a bad reputation in history of always resisting advances in technology. One of the things you mentioned about the Amish is actually it became a reaction. Their lifestyle became a reaction around inventions in the early 1800s. <clears throat> and so they, you know, uh, groups like the Hook and I Mennonites, buttons were like a, a bad thing. And so, you know, the, the hook and the eye is better than buttons. So you, you've got that. Um, I actually had this conversation with my son this past Saturday night because uh, he's very interested in training of ministers for the future. And I was encouraging him that in the metaverse, It'll literally be when you're online through virtual reality or augmented reality, like you're really there in present. And so you don't need bricks and mortar. Now that can really be a good thing. But on the other hand, you've got a thing like Billie Eilish who came out just yesterday uh, and she's 19 years old, very famous singer. But she said at 11, she got addicted to porn and it wrecked her brain. And so this is an evil thing, porn and through technology that she wouldn't have had, had access to 40 years ago. She's saying it literally wrecked her brain. So technology, in my opinion, can be used for good or bad. The problem right now is most of technology, certainly in the United States, is being controlled by media and big corporations who do not have the values of Jesus. They do not have Judeo-Christian values, and they're using their platform to promote their narrative and their belief, which actually hurts people in the long run. You know, biblically, appreciate that, Bobby. Um, biblically, uh, God has always wanted us to depend on him. That's our relationship with him. I created you, I made you your mind. I want you to depend on me. Going all the way back to the garden, when they began to listen to a voice that was not God's, and they ended up sinning. What does God ask? Adam, where are you? Next question was, who told you that? Like, where are you getting this from? I'm your source. So when we leave a dependence on God and depend on other things, that's where we begin to become problematic. And that's anything that that's technology. That's uh, any kind of source outside of God that we depend on. So when, you know, Bobby brings up, I agree with him. Technology in and of itself is just a tool, okay? I can use the same knife to cut a steak that I could use to murder someone. It's just a tool. But how we use it and furthermore, how we depend on it can impact us. I think now, you know, my concern, I don't know the, all the generation names and codes, but I was in a generation where about half of my life uh, was without, you know, a lot of the internet, uh, the Internet was around, but, you know, it wasn't mass available. Uh, cell phones. You know, we still had, you know, a line land, like the landline. That's when I, you know, I grew up. And I came through with how this stuff now has moved to. My sister, she's 10 years younger than me, she's born in a generation that cell phones were there when they arrived. So then you look at how culture was shaped. So for me, I remember, and again, I'm 38, but I remember going out to where you have to be sure to take a quarter in case you need to make a call. They don't have a concept of pay phones like that doesn't. So how does that go with technology now and social media? I grew up a majority of my life or at that point with relationships interpersonal. Like we had to get to know you. We had to see you. We had to meet face to face. Now, you know, Advent or not, the way we look at, uh, you know, social media, a lot of people that I encounter now, I've already met you 
on social media. So when we get together face to face, it's, it's kind of awkward because it's like, well, I kind of know you, but I don't really know. Like we just now, saw, it's, it's a weird, you know. <laughs> So, so here's the thing that I, I just think is a mistake, and please argue with me, but I think it's a mistake. We are not going to take technology away. No, technology no, is no. here to stay. Yeah. So as a pastor and as the leader at Renew Network, what I do is I'm saying to myself, this is the reality. How can we claim it for Jesus? How can we uh, publish posts on Renew.org that everybody's going to read and give them an alternative narrative? How can we have podcasts? How can we promote sermons? How can we promote books? Uh, I literally think that we've got to get more Christians engaged in this whole conversation because it's not going away. And I don't want to cede territory to Satan. I would sooner have godly people speaking up and showing a different way because it's not going to go away. It'll be a part of our lives. And in fact, it'll just increase in our lives in the future. Bob, I hear what you're saying. But having been really blessed in my 54 years to, to have pretty much anything that I want, I've just, I really believe less is more. And, uh, you know, both you and I, and, and I say this somewhat jokingly, but there's like a serious point behind it. You and I have weight problems. I don't know if it was really God's intention for us to have cars, which created drive-through windows, which, you know, we used to have to hunt. And hey, I was used, hunting last week. <laughs> we used to have to do work in order to eat. And if we were back doing that, you and I would be a, a lot smaller and healthier. And so I, 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 I agree with you, it's not going anywhere, but I do think we can make conscious decisions to, hey, let's don't have everything. You know, uh, Glenn Beck, I don't think he has a cell phone. He lit, I think his wife has one. I don't want to give out too much of Glenn's information, but he, he's chosen to live without a cell phone. I think it's smart. I wish I could get rid of mine. Uh, I, I really mean that because the information, the, the temptation, the easy community, I, 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 if I could never text again and people could only contact me on one landline phone that didn't have call waiting, my life I think would be better. I, I really believe that. And I know nothing's going away. Yeah. So I, that could be really good for you. And it may be a that you want to make those choices, and I would encourage you to do that. I'm more concerned uh, from my own vantage point to try to help other people. Like I think today of uh, junior high girls and boys and, and the world they're in, and I just want to engage because I can't change the world everybody's going to be in. Like I can't, I can't get them to step back 20 years. So if this is the way it is, then I want to claim it for Jesus and claim it to help them for Jesus. You know, the one of the verses that I had uh, for this, it actually fits in this uh, mode that we're speaking on. John 10, 10, um, Jesus is talking about him being a good shepherd. But he tells us about the, the difference between the enemy and himself. He says the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. So I see that both Jesus and Satan's mission statement is in the same verse. On one side, Satan, I'm coming for these purposes. Jesus, I'm coming for these purposes. I agree with you in that we need to have the voice in whatever medium for Christ. I I'm with that. My concern, you know, I, I guess relating to Jason's is the dependency on what that world means for people like so so consider this you are definitely in that generation that has a healthy distance from social media like you don't gather your identity from social media you don't gather validation from social media. You see it as a, hey, I'm putting it out. I'm putting out. I, I don't know. I'm not that pure. Yeah, so. yeah. Well, I'm just saying, I'm saying, you know, I, that's, that's where I would put it. But there's a generation of, of, of young people and, and those that are coming through, they can't operate without being in 
the social media world. If if people aren't liking their post that does something to them psychologically, they don't have a healthy validation core at home that, hey, you are made in the image of God. You are this. And so they're putting out their thoughts and they're meeting it back with all these likes and it may not lead anywhere. And, you know, like I said, think about the conditions that Billie Eilish is in that she's seeking out those things that porn at that age and the access that the enemy is going to use for those so, kids. So, so I don't understand mm -hmm. why we wouldn't, for the sake of other people, engage in it. Like, I love your show. I love your mm -hmm. show because you're a fearless voice for the ways of Jesus in this cultural moment. And your social media posts on Twitter or Facebook or whatever, your show on YouTube, I think it's a, it's a great um, cause for good. And I'm so grateful for it. When, when I see you on Tucker Carlson, I just thank God for it because you're engaging in that world where people live for the cause of Jesus. And I just think we ought to do that. I don't think sure. I don't think we can get everybody to be Amish. I just no. I don't think that's going to work. No, no, I, I hear what you're saying, Bob, and I'm not trying to be unrealistic. <laughs> and and, and I, I agree with you. The reason I do the show the way that I do it is because, like, OK, this is where we're at. How do I get my voice, my point of view, people that think like me? How do I elevate yeah. their voice? How, how do I do that? And again, that's one way. Mm. But I feel so sympathetic and sorry for parents because I just think uh, technology yeah. has made it so much harder. And, and, and it's hard for me because, again, at 54, I'm just telling you, just look at daughters and sons and how much access mm -hmm. Satan has to them. In I terms agree. Of, and they can cut out the parents. Yeah. When I was a kid, literally, yeah. you had to call my house. There was one phone, one line. There was no yeah. call waiting. And so even if I wanted to do something sneaky, my mother might answer the phone. But who's calling here? Yep. You know? And so your daughter couldn't be dating some dude 10 years older than her back in those days without mama or daddy getting some kind of wind of it, because the only way to communicate her was to call that phone in that house. Yeah. Now, it's as easy as a D, parents have no clue. No. And so it's much harder to have oversight. What you're saying, what you're saying is exactly, absolutely right. Parents need training on, because most parents, their, their head's not even in the game. They don't even realize what's happening to their kids. And if they're vaguely aware of it, they actually don't know what to do to help their kids. So churches, uh, churches have to be helping parents to deal with all the social media stuff. Like now, we've got to be engaged in not only helping them to do that, but also creating stuff that they can access and get to that is good, wholesome, and right to help them in that quest. So I, I just think uh, it's both limit, but also engage for good in the midst of it. All right, guys, we're out of time. <laughs> But I appreciate the conversation. You've helped me think this through. Still haven't reached any conclusions. Don't know what I think. I'm, I'm, I do think our relationship with death is just out of whack. And I'm gonna come up with a solution. I told her I'm gonna, one day this show's gonna be Fearless with Amish Whitlock. <laughs> <laughs> And we're going to do the whole show in smoke signals. There you go. <laughs> we're going to get off the internet, and people just have to read smoke signals that I send up from the show. All right. That's tomorrow. We'll see you tomorrow. Sitting on the corner, never been alone. I'll break my back for freedom. Bless. We are living, get back. We are receiving, all receiving. We all want to be free. We want freedom. I just want I wanna be, I just want, I wanna be, I just want, I wanna be, I just want.